the participants of this uh, discussions were already met, most of them, uh, this morning. Uh, Dr. George Rupp, Dr. David Rubin, Sir Adam Roberts, Dr. Bingo Adams, and Dr. Michael Ignatiev, who I have not previously introduced. Uh, Dr. Ignatiev is a distinguished academic authority on human rights, a former political leader in Canada. He is the Centennial Chair of Carnegie Council and Professor at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Uh, he served in the Parliament of Canada and was the leader of the Liberal Party of Canada. His books include Human Rights, Politics and Adultery, The Lesser Evil, Political Ethics in an Age of Terror, and most recently, Fire and Ashes, Success and Failure in Politics. So please join me in welcoming Mr. <laughs> he will address us after this panel discussion. Uh, moderator of today's panel discussion is Mr. Mustafa Teric, a former Grand Mufti of Bosnia and Herzegovina, currently serving as president of World Bosnia Congress. His work on interreligious dialogue and understanding has been recognized by many international awards, including UNESCO Felix Hupfe Beni Peace Prize, the King Abdullah I bin Al Hussein International Award, and the Dutch Foundation Peace Prize. Mr. Chair, please take the mic. Thank you. Thank you for uh, this uh, kind and generous introduction. My wife is here. She also knows now who is her husband. Otherwise, I have difficulty. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have privilege compared to your situation. I'm I am here to navigate this discussion after a great this morning of great speeches beginning with His Eminence, Grand Mufti of Bosnia, Hussein Kavazovic, and all others who follow after that. I don't need to repeat you because I recognize your faces that you are almost all those who were who are here, they attended in the morning. But there are new faces here uh, for this session. Uh, later on, I will ask them if they want, I will repeat them what, done, what was said in the morning. So, in order to set up the stage for, for this AQ, I would uh, say just a few words of my small introduction. And I would like to remind you that you are in Sarajevo. Hundred years ago, here in this city, we had a terrorist act of an assassination. Some would say that that was a patriotic act, and others say that this is terrorist. I don't know, but I don't think that we can settle this issue on this session. But the Sarajevo people believe right now that terrorism or violence must be condemned for whatever reasons. That's, I can uh, ask you what the Sarajevo people think. Now, I would like also to greet all those who are following us on different channels. And I was told that about million or so people are watching us from Sarajevo. I would like to bring them also from the city of Sarajevo to the city of peace. Sarajevo is the first Jerusalem of Europe and the second Jerusalem in the world. And Jerusalem means literally the city of peace. I hope that Sarajevo will not be the city of war on the holy world, but the city of the holy peace in the future. Thank you to the Council uh, uh, Andrew Carlingi Council for choosing Sarajevo for its central uh, and coming here with a great start to tell us we are with you 
and we would like to advance the idea of Mr. Andrew Carnegie for a peace, peaceful relationship in the world. They could choose any other city in the world, but they have chosen Sarajevo. So thank you very much. I would like to, to greet them for that. The second thing that I would like to say, and probably that would be my first question, I, I know that you have difficulty to ask now, but allow me to this uh, privileged position that I would ask a question for all the panelists. That, uh, first question, and then, of course, if they feel that they should answer to my question, and then we will give uh, space uh, to you to ask uh, uh, our panelists your questions. My, my question would be <coughs> like Sarajevo, like a man, like somebody who can who can say that is survivor of genocide. That we in Sarajevo, those who survived, we, we can, can say, say now that, that we have survived the genocide. I don't, I don't know, know why God uh, gave us this chance to live in after genocide, but I think we have the message. And in this context, I would like to ask the question like this. Some say that there are three kinds of people. Those who remember, those who think, and those who dream. Basically, most of the people in the world, they are remembering. Less are thinking, and the least are dreaming. I would love to ask my panelists, could you give us some idea for us in Sarajevo? Can we not only remember what happened and not only think what is today? Can you give us some uh, uh, some uh, venue for us in Sarajevo, Sarajevo to dream, dream. a better future for our children? And the better future for our children means the security that genocide will not be repeated to us here in Europe and Israel. So, if you allow me, I will start from my right, because I, I like my right hand. My heart sank when I heard that you like your right hand best. I'm in a, one, one of those, those I think, positions that's only, only too familiar. Foreigners uh, coming into the Sarajevo and giving you advice. It seems I don't like to be in this position. Um, in fact, we've, the right position is um, every time I've been to Sarajevo, I've learned much, much more, more than I have to say. say. And I do mm -hmm. want to make that point very strongly. Um, better hopes for your children. Um, look, uh, your future lies in Europe, and Europe has to give you a signal that they want you in. Your future lies in democratic politics, multi-ethnic, multi-confessional politics, which becomes a politics of citizens rather than the politics of ethnic groups, in which somehow, over the next couple of generations, uh, people act towards each other as strictly as individuals, um, and no longer react towards people as if they all carried a little sign around their necks identifying either by their last names or by the way they dress, what ethnicity they came from. And you're a long way away from that. But, and you've suffered horribly trying to defend a multi-ethnic confessional society in the middle of ethnic nationalism that is most brutal. All of this is difficult. You need a new constitution. 
that allows these things to happen. Nobody thinks you need to be different people. Um, I'm a liberal, so I believe that good institutions matter, and if you have good institutions, then you can start having decent politics in which voters count, politicians are at last accountable to the people instead of ripping people off. I mean, every Sarajevan has ever talked to before the war, during the war, and after the war, said we want to lead a normal life. And a normal life is simply decent institutions, the rule of law, democratic rule, so you can throw the rascals out, so you can throw the people out who skim and steal your money, and above all, a society which takes responsibility for itself. I mean, what is very frustrating for Bosnia and Herzegovina right at the moment is that you're Still, still looking, looking for outsiders to fix the problems because the constitutional situation forces that. I mean, you want to have a society where you actually have self-determination and all its perils and difficulties, which is that you decide. You decide your fate. And uh, so I would put the emphasis on politics here. Not Nobody here has to be any different, but you need better institutions. And better institutions will give you a chance to have the kind of future you, your children uh, want. I'm sorry to go on so long. I think, I think I'm only saying, saying things that I've been told by Sarah, because I'm not telling you anything you don't know, and haven't said better than I've said. So, yeah. Thank you. Mr. Ignacio. Also, we know all of this that you like. When somebody comes from outside and tells us that what we know, we like it. So thank you very much. And also, I appreciate very much uh, this uh, uh, advice of the politicians. And I hope, I don't know how many politicians we have here. I wish that they can hear you. But I want to make sure that I will pass your message to them one day or the, or the other. Uh, Mr. Uh, Rosenthal, thank you very much for taking time to come here and to bless us. And uh, I would uh, uh, just uh, uh, follow what uh, by the end of this statement about the self determination. And I think you emphasized in your uh, speech this idea of self determination. What can you tell us in about it more? Thank you. I just want to uh, emphasize something that <clears throat> Michael said. Um, you know, we come here very humbly uh, to learn. Uh, so I hope that the, um, uh, the spirit of these remarks are accepted, the spirit of mutual learning. Um, I'd also like to just say a word about your opening remarks about remembering, thinking, and dreaming. Uh, this was really the formula of Nathan Carney himself. And he believed that you shouldn't really separate those functions. And um, particularly on this theme of leadership, uh, that leaders should be capable of, of all three and be able to, uh, to help society in that regard. Um, final comment in terms of self-determination. Self-determination is a very incomplete principle. Uh, I think it's something that we do agree on universal terms, that that's a goal. Um, but it has to be implemented in certain contexts, in certain societies, and uh, no simple formula. And I think that the answer to the extent that there is one is for the society to become more itself. It shouldn't be looking elsewhere for answers. Uh, we were treated to war, and we were treated to this video where we saw the ecumenical history. Uh, so perhaps the answer is, is right here, uh, and it's not us. Thank, Thank you very, very much for our uh, which, which makes, makes us uh, stronger, stronger in, in our view of that. It, it was the right decision to have you in this area. Thank you very much. much. And uh, Mr. Rapp, as you talk about religion, religion, religion is more about remembering than thinking and uh, dreaming, except that you dream about paradise or heaven. 
So what do you think, where the religion fits in these three categories? Especially for Sarai. I certainly agree with what uh, Joel has just said and what you implied. I mean, uh, remembering is a base and thinking builds on that and dreaming in turn builds on remembering and thinking. We had the pleasure of a tour of Sarajevo yesterday and among the sites that we saw were the Grand Mosque and the Jewish Synagogue, the Catholic Cathedral and the Orthodox Church. And that's a kind of architectural testimony to the ways in which Sarajevo has historically points that are very important to remember been in what I call this morning an inclusive community. My dream for Sarajevo is that you once again embody that concretely, that the diversity that was prized and treasured in those past years can be rehabilitated and the kind of inclusive community can flourish here. Thank you. Professor Roberts, I think he has more memory than anybody of us because he's emeritus. Uh, and, but his speech was not about remembering. I think he was giving us some prospect for the future. How you see now Sarajevo in 100 years? I just want to tell you that the last century started with war in Sarajevo and ended with war in Sarajevo. The fun history started without war in Sarajevo. Can you send a message to Europe? that they can be calm and say that Sarajevo is at peace? I think your hand is very wise. Uh, your right hand. <laughs> uh, uh, if I may suggest, the answers you have received to your previous questions were so good, uh, so compelling, that uh, I feel inclined to recommend that you stick to the right hand only. Um, <laughs> since you ask, uh, I just say one thing which first of all does relate to memory. The first time I came to Yugoslavia was at the time of Tito's 80th birthday. I didn't come for his birthday, that was coincidence. But um, in uh, 1972. And I was very struck then uh, particularly when I visited Zagreb, uh, at the ways in which there was still some desire for separation. Uh, I overheard a conversation in a cafe in Zagreb about Bangladesh and its secession from India, and it was quite clear that they were thinking about Croatia. And uh, already then, I remember detailed discussions about the complexity of Bosnia and Herzegovina. It was a time of constitutional division in the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. And all of this and other impressions at the time, I was doing research on Obstinovna Obrana. I remember that many years ago. All of that. Left, left me with a strong, strong sense, sense of the worrying continued power, power of the different, the different ethnic and confession divisions in the former Yugoslavia. And when, and when in, the in the 1990s, the breakup break of Yugoslavia began with the Slovene uh, War of Independence, I worried, worried terribly. terribly. Bosnia, I thought, I thought this is excellent for the Slovenians, but what will it do to a place with such uh, divisions of population as Bosnia and Herzegovina? And that worry is still with me today, and that's the one difference from sight with the comment that you heard from my friend Michael. I agree. Really and the importance of developing the language with a more uh, uh, simpler and more direct form of politics, where there is uh, a real power in the voters and in the assemblies to kick out a government that is bad, 
uh, and where there's a closer connection between the voters and those in office. Uh, and I'm not uh, disputing that side of what you said at all, but granted that I have a degree of pessimism still about some of the fundamental divides in society, and particularly about the risk, which is there as a permanent temptation, that the uh, Serb uh, population might at some future date want to secede or set up a separate state or whatever. I believe that a continued international role in Bosnia and Herzegovina is important as a demonstration that Europe is committed to an outcome of democratic politics but without this continuous threat, possible changes threat. It may seem very old fashioned, I think, but I think the risk is sufficiently serious that a continued international presence is valuable. And after all, the continued international presence that we have at the moment is not one that is very obtrusive. It's not one that affects everybody's day-to-day -day activities. But it is a sort of guarantee. And the only thing I would add to that is that this does not mean I'm a pessimist about the development of uh, democratic politics in, in both of the I served, I served as an election observer in Brooksville uh, in the, I think it was 2002 uh, election, is that the, have I got the date right? And I was very impressed that all communities in that region took the business of conducting an honest election very seriously. All the communities served throughout and I had occasion to watch them all. So it's not that I doubt the strength and the attraction of democratic politics, but I think some commitment to all the region from outside is still there. Thank, Thank you very much, and please hold it, because I have a follow-up question. question. Uh, we live, we live in, in Europe, and Europe was uh, torn up by two theses in 19th century and uh, before the First World War and, and later. And that, that is that, that the war legitimized the state. And that, that was Hegel's idea. idea. That the war is the rule of the state. A state comes in the war and the state is maintained. Kant was, was the opposite to that. He, he thought, thought that it is possible to legitimize state by the rule of law, domestic law, and international. Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina is suffering from structural discrimination. Unfortunately, this structural discrimination is imposed on the citizens of Bosnia by the international who are the masters at the moment of our fate. We know very well. So I would like to ask you, how can we get out from this uh, structural discrimination where people in Bosnia, just because of their race, cannot be candidate for any political post, like gypsies or Jewish people only for us, us Russian and, and, and how, how can, can we, we get, get the, uh, come closer to Kant rather than to Hegel? I'm uh, more on Kant's side than Hegel's, and I certainly do not believe that the only justification for a state. The only way in which you can demonstrate success is through war. Think of some of the most successful states in Europe, which have indeed managed to maintain the loyalty of their citizens. Uh, they include Switzerland and Sweden. Sweden has now kept out of international wars for 199 years. And nobody suggests that it has failed as a state just because it hasn't had a war once in a while. Uh, 
So uh, I think that that kind of generalization about the state is somewhat dated. What is true is that the provision of security is an important function of the state. And that may be achieved sometimes in bad circumstances through war. Uh, sometimes it may be achieved uh, through uh, policies of neutrality that may be questioned by others. But at least the state has earned its, the support of its citizens through maintaining uh, security in that way. Now, um, when it comes to uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, I'm convinced that the first thing that has to be done, and we're still in that phase, is the successful demonstration that this society can get beyond war and that the vision that some outsiders presented of history, history of these societies, societies being one continuous story of, of inter-ethnic, inter-religious violence is, is a, specifically a, a, a simplistic version of the past and, and it's certainly it's something that we can be overcome in the present. So, so I, I, do I do think that, that um, um, there is, there is a possibility simply by effective running, running of the system in the present, present that you can then persuade, persuade outsiders to let, let the society move on. on. And, and you are quite right. right. The, the rules drawn up in an Air Force base in Dayton, Ohio, are not rules that must permanently govern uh, this society. And there are discriminatory elements in those rules that were established for understandable reasons at the time. But come on, and, and I am not in doubt, doubt that over time, time there will be a willingness on the part of outside powers to amend those rules. Because after all, there's something profoundly un American about some of the provisions. Uh, they were an emergency set of measures to help end a conflict. And as the society demonstrates that it's got beyond the conflict, those rules will have to be changed. Thank you. I, I hope that. Those who have ears will hear that, <laughs> what you said. Now I just want to ask uh, uh, David to tell us how it is possible to have ethics in war. And uh, I, my experience is that in the, in the time of war, there is no law except the force. So how can we have any ethics in the war. Thank you. Um, before I come to that, let me <clears throat> just briefly uh, come back to the question that you posed at the very beginning about whether Gabriel Princip was a terrorist or a patriot. And to me, the crucial thing there is that those are not mutually exclusive. Uh, a terrorist, in my understanding, is somebody who kills someone who will do the attacks target that ought to be immune from attack. And that can be done by a patriot, by a freedom fighter, and also by a state. And whenever that happens, it ought to be condemned. So I think that, that is an important point. Um, how can there be such a thing as ethics in war? It does seem to many people like an oxymoron. But now I think if we understand ethics and the activity of ethics as the activity of making judgments, and I think that we cannot but escape making judgments about right and wrong within the war. And we have to remember that we condemn activities, activities like terrorism, like indiscriminate action, like the killing of civilians, uh, is to make an ethical judgment. And in that sense, there not only can be ethics of war and ethics in war, but there has to be, it has to be a beginning point. And just to connect that with the um, the other very nice question that you posed at the outset about remembering, thinking, and dreaming. Uh, and somebody who has made his career in philosophy is very much committed to the endeavor of thinking and to the possibility that by thinking about hard problems in a way that is honest and rigorous and pursued to the best of our abilities can be a very powerful way of making progress. 
But the important thing for me is that that process of thinking can sometimes lead to very, very powerful dreams. And because you mentioned him, I want to use uh, an example of Immanuel Kant. So Immanuel Kant famously published a pamphlet called The Petrol of Peace, which was a philosophical dream if there ever was one. And which for a century after it was published was seen as a kind of crazy fantasy. I think Kant himself was aware of how it would have been and it was indeed perceived in that way. And yet, after the Second World War, the conditions were there for the creation of a European Union that in almost every major respect is the living political institutional embodiment of that philosophical dream that Kant put forward all those centuries before. So by all means dream, by all means remember, but have it supported and undergirded by honest, rigorous, detailed thought. Thank you, David. So you will kind of just dream that one day in Bosnia we will have a constitution based on the citizenship rather than ethnicity and national groups. Thank you very much. I think we, we have the right to dream that. Now I would uh, ask my, our neighbor, uh, professor who uh, brought the, uh, this conflict between Cain and Abel. And if I may ask you, will ever Cain come to Abel and say sorry? Because I lived in Chicago for five years, but I like from what we American, uh, Europeans have to learn from Americans is two words. Thank you and sorry. <laughs> These two words we don't know how to use it. Is it possible that in Balkan we will learn one day to say to others, sorry, I will not repeat my time? I can't say, obviously, um, but I think that that is uh, certainly one way out of the situation in which Bosnia and Herzegovina finds itself. And that is why uh, I think every voice that comes from those communities that are particularly responsible for what happened in Bosnia and Herzegovina that departs from the national crowd and is critical of responsibility of one's own uh, country, political leadership, whatever, is uh, something that should be supported. Um, uh, not in a way that makes them, in a certain sense, uh, apart from their native base, because that would not be particularly helpful, but in a way that would encourage others to think critically. And I think that can be done in various ways. In that sense, returning to your earlier question about uh, can there be any guarantees that genocide will not be repeated in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Again, the same pattern. Uh, of course, there are guarantees. But the best way to uh, prevent any uh, such future occurrences is uh, to lessen tensions wherever they are present. And that means basically the policy of the politics of um, restraint. I'm not going to give you any examples, and I think you know, we all understand what uh, I am referring to, perhaps not some of our visitors from abroad, but there are a number of things that have recently happened in Sarajevo that could have been avoided, that served no particularly useful purpose. One, why must one have a particular statue, a particular this, particular that, that, you know, we can do without. Uh, so it's terribly, terribly important to avoid those who are breaking from the crowd, and it's very important within one's own community to practice restraint. Uh, uh, that would be uh, an investment in coexistence with others. Thank you very much. I hope that the audience got enough inspiration for their own questions. Now I am open the floor for those who want to ask, introduce yourself, and be short as much as you can. Say uh, whom you uh, direct your question, please. Is there anyone? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Please. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Osman Softwich. I uh, studied at 
Faculty of Islamic Studies and in Sarajevo and International Relations in Australia. I've been back in, in Bosnia for the last five years and currently I'm coordinating research activities between Al Jazeera Balkans and Al Jazeera Center for Studies in Doha. My question, uh, it's not particularly directed to any of uh, the speakers. Um, so feel free to answer if you, if you feel that you would like to give an answer to it. My concern is that we here in Bosnia live in a multi-ethnic society which is often praised as a Jerusalem of Europe. At the same time, uh, it is cited Bosnia is cited internationally as one of the most successful examples of successful international humanitarian intervention. At the same time, for the last 20 years, we've been uh, held back and, and ethnic relations have not much improved. So I don't know if we can call it a real success because most of us here feel that the war has been going on in this country for the last 20 years by other means. Uh, do, you, do you feel that you would like to give uh, some explanation to what I've just mentioned? So it's not a question, but it is comment. a comment. I see that. Thank you. Uh, well, I... Anyone want to make his comment? Just very briefly, I, I think the comment's a very interesting one, particularly the last provocative sentence about war has been going on for the last 20 years. And I understand those feelings. I, I just think that it's important to be careful about the use of language. No one is dying in Bosnia at the moment. And that's different. The, that other, that various groups within Bosnia are seeking to dissolve the precarious peace, that various groups are seeking to get advantage over others, that some groups are even wishing to separate and secede, all this stuff um, is not good. But no one's dying here. I think it's... It's a bit ridiculous for an outsider to counsel patience. I mean, why should you be patient? You know? But I think on a day when we're celebrating a century of change, it's important to remember how long things take and, and how important it is to acknowledge simple facts like the fact that people are not dying, and not killing. And that's very precious. And it, it's and a politics of restraint is just so important here. Um, uh, and and to build on what's positive somehow is, is terribly important. And to refuse every pretext, provocation, invitation to go back to war or violence of any kind. Um, it really matters not just for Bosnia, but for the world. Um, every time a country like Bosnia succumbs back into war, every time there's an incident in Northern Ireland where people get shot, the whole world feels <laughs> that the possibility of multi-ethnic, multi-religious, confessional, constitutional settlements take a step back. And God knows we need some step forward. I mean, I think the thing in Bosnia is you often feel abandoned, as it were. You know? But part of the reason that people come here today is to say, you know, there are a lot of people out there. I'm one of them, and I think everybody on the platform and thousands of other people really care about what happens here. It really matters that a politics of restraint wins here over time. And that's just, I got all my fingers and toes crossed. 
I, I see, I saw next to Osman. Yeah. Did you? No, no, I, I saw your, your... No, 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 I was just passing the microphone, but I do have a question. Okay, okay, that's good, okay. I'm um, very sensitive to anyone raising anything. Okay, please. Thank you. My name is Rafi Kotic. I come from the International Center for Transitional Justice, but more importantly, uh, from Prieto in, in North Western Bosnia, where uh, the dynamics that you are talking about are playing out, I would say, much more than in Sarajevo itself because there is no international presence in Prieto. But my question is, is uh, to do with something else, and that is, in your opinion, and I would pose this to uh, Professor Barnett uh, and Professor Ignatius first, but also to everyone else, how much does the economic transition uh, that uh, we are undergoing, that I would equate with, with outright plunder, that, that has co-opted politics for its um, sort of dynamic uh, and the international context, especially what is happening now in terms of realignment uh, that we can see in Ukraine of international uh, relations, but also uh, the, the challenges to the international law that we have that we can see in Syria uh, have to do with the stalemate and the absence of progress in Bosnia. Thank you. I think Mr. Banas. Um, on the first, I, I really could not give you anything that would be particularly valuable except the obvious. Um, if the situation were better, possibly it would have political implications. On the second, that is something which I take very, very seriously, and uh, it really did not start with the uh, Crimean uh, crisis, Ukrainian crisis. We have had uh, a process of realignment uh, in work for quite some time. And uh, I suppose you sense it better in Priedo than in many other places. Um, uh, it's, uh, I think, very fortunate for Bosnia, for Croatia, for uh, Kosovo that uh, Yeltsin was in power during the 1990s rather than, uh, than his successor, uh, Putin. Uh, because I'm quite certain that things would have been far worse. Uh, there is um, a Cold War that is being played in the only area of Europe where Russia can play the role of a major power. This is Southeastern Europe. And this business of creating clients, uh, which is sometimes successful, sometimes not successful, is something that is uh, significantly changing the face of the region. The fact that Mr. Dodik is apparently tied with the current Russian leadership to the point of being practically a client, I think is very significant. And this, uh, uh, for those who follow closely, is in evidence every day. Just a couple of days ago, uh, uh, there was an unveiling of statue of uh, Nicholas II in the presence of the ambassador of the Russian Federation to Bosnia and Herzegovina with Mr. Dodik. What's the point of that? Uh, uh, there are a number of these things that, of course, are tied in with uh, one uh, fluid which gives Russia influence. And that, of course, is. Uh, oil and gas, and uh, uh, energetics. You know perfectly well to what extent Russian investments in uh, these elements in particularly Republika Srpska is significant today. I'll give you one example which, is, um, uh, which shows how these influences transcend borders. You know perfectly well that the ref refinery in uh, Bosansky Broad, which is owned by a state company from the Russian Federation, is a cause of enormous pollution across the Sava River in Slavonsky Broad in Croatia. And I couldn't for the devil of it understand why the Croatian government is so passive on this. Because the uh, oil that is being refined in Bosansky Broad comes via Croatian territory to Bosansky Broad. They could simply say, no, we are not going to allow this, put in a different, uh, cleaner affinity, and then you can continue with your business. But nobody could give an answer to this. Talk to the mayor of Slavonsky Broad, he doesn't have an answer. 
Finally, uh, I decided to talk to somebody who was very close to the Minister of uh, Environmental Protection. And you got uh, actually very authentic and uh, actually perfectly predictable answer. He said, of course, you know, please, you know, this is something that we cannot discuss, but we do not wish to offend Moscow. We do not wish to have bad relations with Russia or you. So this is the type of a dynamic that is at work in the whole Balkan Peninsula, sometimes very direct, as in the Serb entity in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, I would say the same for Bulgaria, uh, perhaps less so in some other countries. In Serbia, it is mixed bag, this way, that way. Uh, uh, in Montenegro, they have bolted against it to the point that uh, pro-Russian churchmen in Montenegro uh, have condemned uh, Djukanovic to uh, in internal, eternal fire. Yeah? Uh, so, uh, but it's a, it's a dynamic which I, ch I think has an enormous influence for the development in the region. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was discussing something, sorry to take so much time, uh, with uh, a very prominent historian over what was wrong with the Dayton uh, conference. And he said, you know, uh, the problem with Dayton was that no power took direct responsibility for each given community. For example, Germany should have uh, claimed uh, uh, protection over the Croats, uh, France over the Bosniaks, Russia over the Serbs. Frankly, I think that is a terrible idea. Uh, we do not wish to have such, uh, such uh, uh, client relations in this part of the world because should that happen, I think that we will be farther away from any sort of solution than we are today. Well, if I might, before I give the professor Ignatiev uh, to answer, no, no on this or any other, I. This is a very good uh, answer from a professor who is known to be very straightforward and very truthful. But I would, I, I would then ask a question. Why should we blame the Russia? Russia is fighting for its spheres. I would ask Europe, what is Europe doing? divided about Bosnia, and Americans are busy with many other issues in the world. But I would like to remind you that Sarajevo is not a local issue. It has been, it is, and it will be all the time a global issue. The proof is the First World War and the Second World War. You know, the Tito, the partisans, they won the Second World War in Bosnia, not in any, anywhere else. So I am asking you, what would you now, what message would you send to the European leaders to let Russia do its business that is doing, or they will do something about its house, and we are in the house of Europe. Well, I thought uh, Ivo did a masterful job of showing the Russian influence here. And I think your question is about what the comparable action from, from Europe has been. And I think the dimension of this that needs to be added, and which is discouraging, frankly, is that Europe, Europe's strategy in Eastern and Southern Europe was enlargement and or offering the prospect of enlargement. Um, but the domestic backlash against enlargement inside Europe is just a political fact that Bosnians have to understand. Germans, large amounts of the German public are very unhappy that Bulgaria came in, that Romania came in. Um, not so crazy about the idea of Serbia coming in. Not terribly happy about Croatia being in. I mean, there's just, there's a backlash. And so 
when you say, which I think is right, that Bosnia is an international issue, it's an international issue because just as in 1992 to 5, it became the test case of what Europe believes in, it's once again the same test. That is, is this one continent or isn't it? And this is the fundamental issue. If you don't have a route towards Europe that is clear, definable, sets up criteria that mean you have to clean up your political system and you have to get the rule of law working and all the stuff that an accession process puts you through, you haven't got a future. And Europe is going to have to, I mean, the one hypothesis I might advance is that as the Russians begin to take the actions that they're taking, it may simply force Europeans to a prise de conscience, as the French say, and decide strategically that it's time to give, to make this one continent. Because if it isn't one continent, then what does it become? It starts to fall apart. Um, Bosnia that becomes a source of instability, potentially again a source of terrorism. I mean, the, the nightmare scenarios are very easy to spin out here. And so the geostrategic prise de conscience that Europe has to take about Bosnia is a more general prise de conscience about what is Europe for, where is it going, is this one continent or two? And it is one continent. And the whole logic of Dayton, Dayton has been much criticized, and entirely justly so, is that frankly, Dick Holbrook understood what Europe was better than the damn Europeans, and I don't care who knows it. That is, he understood strategically that unless the war in Bosnia was ended, the whole European security project was, was jeopardized. As you point out, America has now stepped back from this, leaving this Dayton architecture, which was never supposed to last more than a couple of years and has now lasted, what is it, 18? that must be fixed and must be changed. And it will only be changed by action from below, by Bosnian citizens saying, enough, this is, we got three times too many politicians, we got three times too many levels of government, we're forced into ethnic divisions which make no sense, that make it impossible for us to create a post-conflict society. Um, the whole operation is an in, is a is an instrument for skimming and corruption. It's got to change. So there has to be pressure from below, and then there has to be this prise de conscience from the top that says, we can't leave this the way it is. And maybe the geostrategic motive is, Russia's on the march. I don't like that as a motive. I like a much more positive motive, which is we're proud of this continent. It's one continent, not two. We don't have divisions in the house. There's one European house, not two houses. And that's where it needs to evolve. But I can't. But I think that that um, moments like this, this kind of gathering, and many others, should be part of a political process in which the message is very simple: wake up. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that you would like to, that we continue uh, this discussion, but. Time is always um, is not on our side. I think we are coming to the end, but because I am privileged here, I I will try to uh, sum it up and thanks to you for your patience and also just to um, follow up what you said about whether we are part of the continent. What is the Europe? What is Europe? And where is Bosnia? I would answer to this: Bosnia is a miniature of Europe. So as Europe cannot stand alone without uh, Euro-Atlantic association, Bosnia cannot stand alone without association, Euro-Atlantic association. First of all, NATO, security-wise, we must solve the problem. You see, I, I talk to many people in Bosnia. You know what they say? If the Brussels doesn't want to, to do anything, 
If Washington is not willing to do anything, we should go to Moscow and ask Russians. Probably they have the key for our solution. So why we are waiting uh, on the door for NATO? And we know that all the politicians signed the full membership of NATO. We need you peace and security. Yesterday, not today. And this uh, negligence of the Bosnian problem, I'm afraid, that will come as a boomerang to the, to the Europe and to the West. And because of that, I think you're coming on this occasion to highlight the issue of 100 years of the First World War and what we hear from you. I just want to pass you voices, voices of people that I knew, and there are many, that they appreciate your coming. I hope this is not first time. I hope that Carnegie Institute will open office in Sarajevo to teach us how to make ethics, not in war, but in peace. Hmm? And also to make uh, our relationship inside and outside better, as Andrew Carnegie dreamt to, to do so. So thank you very much for your coming. Thank you for your patience. You are a very nice audience, I can see. And I would like to ask our uh, conferencier to say if uh, her remarks and then we have the closing remarks and may God bless you. Come again to Sarajevo. Sarajevo is a nice, peaceful, loving city. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cherish. What to add to this? Um, if I just may say so, it's a very complex topic and I don't think it all answers can never be found, but we are one step closer. Mm -hmm.